Land Architectos is an architecture firm committed to innovation in the design of projects that enhance the relationship between the built and the natural environment and also in ones that are able to adapt over time. The two principals, Angela De Lorenzo and Cristobal Valenzuela, together with the whole team, integrate environmental and social initiatives in the design process, hoping that they will promote and empower local values in the long term. So on top of being known for the strong ties between the built and natural environment, land now is also involved in a watershed planning project in the North Patagonian lakes. And so Angela and I will later converse about the water resource, climate change, and also the bigger potential impact they'll have on the ecosystem. So thank you so much, Angela, for being here. So great to have you. Thank you, Karina. <laughs> That's awesome. So I think we can start with you sharing a bit about land. Sure. Yeah. As you were saying, we started this firm together with another architect about 13 years ago uh, with the aim to contribute to the field in how the built environment and structures relate to the natural environment and natural systems. So as a result, we have been working in different scale of projects from architecture scales to environmental planning project scales and collaborating with multidisciplinary teams to achieve informed design. Um, our approach to design has been from the effort to understand the real impact of one specific site beyond, let's say, its legal boundaries, you know, or administrative boundaries, political, but more of the real boundaries, you know, that interwine with, with other systems, uh, which has taken us to understand site from this broader perspective, for instance, from a watershed impact um, point of view and or uh, urban impact point of view. So we strongly believe that every project presents an, uh, as an opportunity to produce positive or negative impact. So which has led us to focus our practice in promoting environmental and social initiatives through our design projects. For instance, we designed a small rural school for uh, for 20 students. This is in the middle of nowhere in a rural area in the central area of Chile. And, and we designed in a way that it could serve a broader community as a community center and being able to broaden in this way its potential impact. So introducing, for example, space for planting or a small scale agriculture, having a bike park, having spaces for people to meet. And so, so taking it beyond its, its side limits uh, and having this social impact. And other examples are, for instance, we have been working in, in master plan areas uh, where we have promote uh, conservation easements to protect uh, native ecosystem located in urban or rural areas that have a major significance for the environment and also for the cultural lo local landscape. So, so we really think you can always somehow find something that your project can move forward, can promote and and yeah, so that's what we have been doing in, in land. Yeah. And I think if you focus on a cost that it makes it so much more liberating and free, right? And the breadth of projects you can take on to achieve that that cost. As you were saying, it can be from architecture projects to planning and conservation projects. So yeah, why don't you tell us more about the watershed planning project at the North Patagonian Lakes? Sure, yeah. Well, Chile Lagos Limpios is the name of this project, or in English will be Clear Lakes for Chile. So this is an initiative that started uh, on 2017 when we were working, developing a master plan for a private 50 hectare site at one of the North Patagonian Lakes. Uh, we saw that there was an opportunity to use this project as an excuse to bring more awareness and knowledge about lake preservations to local or visiting communities. This was a point where people at the lakes were realizing uh, about the impacts and a lot of conflicts between development and local communities were arising. So we organized a small technical mission to visit Lake Tahoe located in 
in the US, uh, both in the states of California and Nevada, it's like almost half and half. Uh, and we attended to a workshop that the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency organized very kindly for us, uh, where they explained their efforts been made for the last 60 years to keep Lake Tahoe clear. Basically, there is its main asset and being able to balance in a way developing development they have a really thriving economy but at the same time preserving the resource you know so in this workshop we realized that tahoe 60 years ago was really confronting similar uh, problems that the ones we were seeing now in the north patagonian lakes in chile to explain the north patagonian area is uh, we have the south patagonia and this is the north patagonia that is like it distinguished in a way because it's watersheds start to be binational. So they start in Argentina. So that's why that's one of the indicators that we are in Patagonia, you know? So, but it's the Northern area. So in a way it's the one that is suffering more impact because it's the, the central area that is the most developing is advancing to this area. And with climate change, it's becoming a much more easy uh, place for settle and develop agricultural activities, among others. And also it's a very touristic area, okay? So I just wanted to, to give that, that context. So, uh, so in May 2018, after this, this trip to Tahoe, we organized a seminar at one of the lakes, Lake Panipuyi, with local corporations and with support of local government. We brought three speakers from Tahoe, uh, financed with private, public, and international funds. The U.S. Embassy here in Chile also support us to bring uh, two of the speakers. The seminar was a real success. There's some videos you can watch on <laughs> YouTube, actually. And, and it was great because we saw there was this real interest, you know, from the different sectors. Uh, and so we decided, together with these three other participants, speakers from Tahoe, to create an NGO to ensure water quality while promoting sustainable development in the long term for the North Patagonian lakes. All this in this climate change context that I was saying that, was, that it's really somehow putting a big pressure in these lakes in the short and the long term for, for change. So the premise here is to transfer knowledge from Tahoe to build a Chilean governance and scientific tool that can be used later, not only in the North Patagonian lakes, but maybe in the South Patagonian lakes or other watersheds in Chile. And yeah, I think that somehow sum up the work we're doing in Chile Lagos Limpios. I see. Wait, sorry, if we can trace back a bit, um, you were mentioning problems starting to arise. Um, what sorts of problems were they? Well, there were different kinds of conflicts. Uh, to name a few, uh, the one that kind of more like uh, create like more alarm, I guess. Uh, in Chile, we have a law that when, you know, um, sanitary water treatment plants, if they collapse when, when it rains, they can in some point open their gates or whatever to and, and have some overflow to, to the water body, in this case, to the lake, you know. The problem with the law that it, in Chile we have such a big range of climates, you know, from desert to really like one, like some parts are more, probably one of the most rainy areas in, in the world. So in places where it doesn't rain, maybe an overflow could happen once a year, maybe never. But in these lakes, when you, where you have around 800 or 1,000 millimeters a year, overflows can, were happening maybe 15 times, you know, <laughs> or more. And maybe people before they didn't realize or now we're, when you have more people living there, the, the plant is more over, you know, has more pressure, you know, like there's more urban water entering, plastering water, so overflows were going to the lake. So for example, there was this one lake uh, that the main beach had to be closed. Uh, because of the, the contamination that went out from one of those overflows. And this was in, in summer, and these places have an important uh, economy related to tourism. So, so that was um, something that people were uh, very shocked about. It impacts your health, you know, directly. And what, that was one of the alarms. Then you have other conflicts related to real estate development, people not being able to somehow um, 
agree and, and what kind of development I guess they want if which area should be more dense or or have sky rises or so that's that conflict started to 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 develop and also uh, people not understanding something natural ecosystems so uh, the destruction of wetlands for example was another problem that arise and and then you had some problem also with some industry and and people not being able to agree on how much if the con the contamination they they were producing is um, it's okay or not because we don't have uh, for all the lakes environmental standards that regulate that so and I could keep on and keep on going because there are a lot of things like we have in summary I would say there's a huge pressure for these places to be developed but at the same time we have our regulations are poor you know right. so so it's um, and being a regulations poor you know there and, and having little data so there's little information and little uh, and, and the data that is is not really validated like people sometimes don't trust in this data you know makes it harder you know it makes it really hard to to agree in and how these places should be developed in a way that you can have development that is needed to. So we are talking about three of the areas that are more like regions that have more poverty, uh, poverty index, like the highly poverty index in the country. So, so it's not that we can stop development there, you know, and people need activity. But at the same time, uh, not at any cost, you know, like it needs to be uh, done in a way that you can keep on uh, maintaining environmental value and also a thriving economy. That is the example of Tahoe, for example, that's a, a success case study. And that's why it's so relevant for us and a benchmark in a way for us in, in Chile. Right. So I'm noticing that the problems were kind of systemic challenges, I say. Yeah, with the regulation, planning, and so, I mean, it makes so much sense that what you're trying to come up with, the solution, is systemic solutions. Um, like you mentioned before, you were trying to create a system that can be replicated somewhere else, right? Not only does it work in the North Patagonian lakes, but it'll also work in the South and maybe someplace else. Um, so I think this project seems to be a great example of using science, policy, and regulation to build better. And in the case of architecture, how do sciences, policy, and regulations help you connect to nature? Sure, yeah. So, well, well one of our key areas at Chile Laos Limpios is science. Uh, we have two important work areas, and one of this is, is science. and. One of our partners here is uh, the Tahoe Environmental Research Center from um, UC Davis. We are working on transferring a mathematics 3D model, which is a UC Davis public good, to Chile. So the key of this model, like the key outcome of this model is that shows how contaminants move around the lake once they enter the water. And as a consequence, enables to understand how the different land uses impact the lake. So you can, in this way, inform decision-making in terms of public policies or, or private design standards with information. So in that way, uh, our second work area, uh, it's advocacy because uh, we really need to, to, to transfer you know, this information we're producing to key stakeholders, decision-makers, you know, or everyone uh, at the end of the day to start building a new culture related to the lakes and also informing this public policies and private standards and practices in the short and in the long term run so and i guess if you take this to an architecture project the process you know behind behind design should follow somehow a similar methodology of understanding where uh, which are the different variables that relate to a specific site and being able to support the most relevant you know, variables regarding a specific design objectives because you cannot solve for all, you know, 
that's why I was saying like before, like somehow choose your battle, you know, but then uh, being able to pursue that objective with reliable data too. And today we live in the world of data, you know, so there's no excuse like to find out a little bit more of something that it's really cutting your attention in a in, in specific site and in this way inform design processes that can result in structures that enhance place and quality of life because many times as architects we forget we get to a place you know and, and forget to un un understand what is happening at the places as in a social level you know how people are using the space or how that place is important in other levels that are not for you you know and understanding that part i think it's pretty key to you know like to to leave something that in some place that will make sense not just a natural from a natural perspective also from a social perspective and yeah yeah i totally agree so often you know the idea of conservation is associated with like not touching it at all or not intervening in any shape or form but uh, this case shows otherwise um, so how can building a system or anything on top of what already exists um, can actually help preserve something yeah well i believe that one of the main challenges for chile at least um, is finding a balance between intervening in a way that helps preserve the landscape and at the same time improve lives of people who relate to the spaces. I was just saying. So there are many examples of landscape, for example, that are full of trash, erosion, informal buildings, suffer from intentional fires as a result of not intervening in the right way, you know, like or not doing anything. From another perspective, we have amazing remote landscapes here in Chile with communities that still live from primary activities like artisan fishery, cattle, self-sufficient agriculture uh, that need development, you know, need opportunities. So um, they need in a way to keep on doing what they do in a way that or is not damaging to the environment or evolve to other kinds of activities and if you just block activities from those places, from those places uh, you take growth opportunities from people that need so landscape landscapes to thrive. Uh, so I strongly believe that human activities should and can be combined, you know, with preserving environment. And and here's where I think architects have a, an important role, you know, of connecting natural and built systems through structures in a way that this can be achieved. And even though there will probably still be places that need to be not like access or intervene directly you know but you still need to put some kind of system or structure so that actually remains like that so yeah <laughs> yeah and i guess it kind of answers my next question too about what kinds of things we need to pay attention to when we are trying to preserve or are we trying when we're trying to intervene aside yeah i think it's it's this need, you know, to take a broader perspective, you know, how our interventions can really impact the built and natural system at broader scale. And at least, as I was saying before, pick one battle, you know, pick one battle for the project to win and improve some environmental social condition in some way. I think it's always possible and it's, we have a responsibility as architects, you know, of, of taking that, that opportunity that, 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 you know, it's given to you even though it's like some projects, of course, have more potential than others, but, but you can always do something. You can always uh, be a contribution, you know, and I think it's really important to think from that point. Yeah, I agree. And I guess based on your experience, what are the benefits of designing in nature? Maybe um, taking advantage of the wind, elevation, natural energy and how do you use them for passive sustainable strategies well i think we're always designing in nature like i don't believe we can dissociate from this fact we can ignore it but but, but it's always something that it's it's happening it's where we we are you know <laughs> and even in a high dense urban area you're always within a watershed 
you can always uh, find biodiversity patterns, um, local heating island effects or other local conditions can be found. So, so you're always intertwined in some way with natural aspects or social aspects, I would say. Uh, I believe that passive sustainable strategies are the basis in a way for relating with your local environment, like considering, I don't think super like basic like ventilation, the grading or natural light as, as you were mentioning. And if you add technology, great, but it's not always needed to achieve space, like quality of space, um, which, is, like, which is what we really look to achieve through high quality design. Like you can, you could achieve comfort, a comfortable space without taking in account aesthetic or space quality. But for us, it, uh, it's a big piece of the puzzle that uh, this, this, the space is not only achieved comfort in terms of temperature, you know, but it's also has space quality. I think that adds also uh, an important asset to, to quality, improving quality of life. Right. Yeah, so that was the case of using nature and elements in nature to build, right? So what about the effects that building itself can have on the broader ecosystem around it? Yeah, I would think I would like to think that building with nature nature means using information from natural systems to guide and inspire the design process. As you would use uh, data related to, as you were you mentioned it, like program number of occupants or or whatever other specific data or a specific you know building that you can obtain. I think that making the effort to understand what is really going on in a specific location and how this connects to a broader urban and natural ecosystem makes the difference from using nature just uh, and not thinking that you're in a white canvas, you know, like using places as white canvas and just having your list of requirements. And you need to understand that we don't have white canvases, even in the most tricky ones, you know, <laughs> there are not white canvases. There are always things that are interwining and happening and going along and that you really need to Take a look into. Mm, nice. So I think this conversation is such a great example of how science, policy, and design is so connected to each other, especially when you sequence it clearly earlier that data-driven science will inform policy and policy will then inform the design. So we can see how they're all so interrelated. Because, you know, sometimes designers often overlook the science part of it, you know, because we're so focused on meeting regulations and policies. So it'll be like the best of both worlds if policies are already backed with powerful data. And, you know, just be transparent about it so that everyone will know the thinking behind, right? Yeah, yeah I guess like, yeah, like you always, but today, like, as I was saying also like there's so much data available like and or so easy to to produce data or to collect some kind of data and 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 I think it's also there's also a risk I guess to get stuck there you cannot like as you can get stuck with regulations I was saying like if you get stuck with regulations and and then you get stuck to with data you are also your your design results could also suffer you know i think it's just a basis and then you really need to get creative how you go around it and and that's where people enter you know like there's 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 that is the space where we cannot be replaced in a way you know like like uh, it's not that for example there's this discussion like today in chile like there's this new uh, law that the ministry of housing and uh, wants to to promote that is saying for example to the north side of um, buildings you can do 100 percent windows but to the south just half of it for example mm -hmm. and well i'm today i'm part of this um associations of office of architecture it's, it's an like an ngo and part of the board and, and we we're having this discussion because they're fighting back in a way this uh, this new regulation or law that wants to be passed 
because it's it enables the design process you know like it's not it's not they cannot they should not tell you how to you know they should tell you what is the the, spect the expectation you know like the the goal and then you as a designer look the way or the or that's your role you know but if they if they tell you how you're limiting everything because there's so many ways that things can be achieved and that's the beauty you know of having different people behind things you know and and bringing their own thing to design so so that's for example one battle in a way that that has been given here between like don't restrict form you know restrict parameters give us parameters standards uh, give us guidelines but don't give us form because that's where you as a designer enter yeah so I can, that's a very powerful ending so lesson is be critical be curious and also be creative at the same time <laughs> Totally, totally. Right. So thank you so much, Angela, for the chat. I'm glad we get to know the firm and also the initiatives. Um, I hope, we, I mean, we wish you the best for not only for this project, but also for the projects to come. And we hope that we will be able to see the results soon enough. Great. Yes. Thank you, Karina. Thank you for, for this conversation, interesting questions and great discussions. Thank you.